Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Mythic Championship 2 from London. That is Paul Chiano, Marshall Cycler. Thanks so much for coming along. We've got Booster Draft. We just uh, had a chance to watch two players draft, Olivia Ruel and Yuya Watanabe. But now we get to see what happens when these decks get into action. We're going to start things off on our front table here with Olivier Ruel, the Frenchman Hall of Famer there on the left. Looks like he's just about getting ready for battle here. He drafted a... Well, a Crunch-themed deck. He kind of uh, went with the Crunch Wranglers and then tried to pick up as many four-power creatures as possible. On the other side of the table, though, um, Fernando David Gonzalez has kind of a, a brew here. Uh, you know, when we look at these deck lists, Paul, what we usually do is start with the basic lands. And uh, when I was talking to you about it, I was yeah. like, all right, he's got forests, islands, mountains, and swamps. Oh, so just all oh, so he just dra dra drafted Yuya's deck, maybe? Yeah, he drafted... <laughs> If you were watching Yuya Watanabe's draft with us here oh live... Oh my god, what a sweet deck. A little worse version, I have to say, in Fernando's uh, hands here. But it's basically blue-black based, and then he stretched his mana for some really great gold cards in both green and red. Okay, fair enough. He's got a Spellkeeper weird here, but double Crunch Wrangler opener. The big question <laughs> here for Olivier is, can he find <coughs> that four-power creature to get the triggers going and start the attacks flowing on his side of the battlefield? Yeah, this is about as straightforward of a deck as you can get. And that's a turret ogre. So that does count. Bang! And He's going to get in for three. This is what Olivier drafted. Just a bunch of crunch wranglers. I think he has four in his deck. And as many four-power creatures to kind of turn them on when yeah. possible. Yeah, you, you are correct, by the way, Paul. He has four copies of Crunch Wrangler. All of them made it into the main deck. And then on the other side, uh, when you look at it, you know, the card that really stands out the most is the Raging Crunch. And he ended up with two of those. Yes. Yeah, he even took one over a band together, um, which is a very good removal spell. But again, when you have triple Crunch Wrangler, I mean... It's just kind of like a theme deck, right? You just take the Enraged Crunch. Yes. The crunches were made to go together. You, you do what you got to do, <laughs> as they say in the business. There's a Thunder Drake on the battlefield now for <laughs> Fernando. One of the ways that he can get ahead in a game is by using Thunder Drake. You know, you cast your second spell, send it to 3-4 with flying. In the meantime, though, Olivia Ruel says, you know, I'm going to put the pedal to the metal and kind of force you to trade this thing off with one of my lowly Crunch Wranglers, and that's exactly what happens here. So Fernando falls down to 11 after taking four. But Olivia from the needs ogre. Olivia needs something here because Ashiok Skul uh, Skulker is just now wow. completely brick walling all of these creatures. More like Ashiok's stop sign here. And look at Olivia. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe it. Three five, my only weakness. He had the Ashiok Skulker. How did you know? Oh wow, he's really feeling it. And he just has to pass the turn back. Wow, some real emotion there. Yep. From Olivier, I like it. Yeah, he had, you know, pretty much the start that you were looking for. But, um, you know, this is why combat tricks are really, really important for this red-green deck. You know, there was a bunch of giant growths that were kind of going around the table. And he had multiple opportunities to take them. And, you know, it, it is kind of like a premium common in this type of strategy. The bad news continues for Ruel here. Fernando <laughs> adds another Ashiok Skulker to the battlefield. He's running, I believe, three of those. Let me double check. Yeah. Yeah, Fernando. He has three, and he's running all of them. Yeah, he, Fernando drafted a very defensive, controlling, uh, you know, blue-black base deck with some splashes. But, you know, I think he's kind of using, looking at the Ashok Skulkers as not only a good blocker, but also a finisher in the end game. Because, you know, at some point, you do need to finish the game, and this does, it, this does have the mana sync ability to make it unblockable. All right, well, Fernando is going to play one of his two copies of <coughs> Mana Geode here. This is an artifact that lets him tap for any color of mana to facilitate those splashes that we mentioned before. And we could tell you what those are, by the way. We haven't mentioned that. There's two copies of Death Sprout, the powerful mm. removal spell. And then that can also, kind of interestingly, get him the red mana <laughs> that he needs for his copy of Rao Storm Conduit, the Planeswalker. And he's also got Rao's Outburst. And... Paul, we saw yesterday what can happen if you have both of those on right. the battlefield or well, in your hand. I, I mean, Ral, I think, is just a very, very powerful planeswalker. If you just, you know, we have a lot of good removal available to us. I mean, imagine copying a Death Sprout, right? Just like any of those high impactful <laughs> removal spells yeah. uh, can go a long way. And on top of that, the fact that Ral just has so much loyalty, starting at four and then having a plus two ability for the scry, means that it's really difficult to get off the battlefield. I see that Fernando is holding a copy of Rao's Outburst in his hand as well. And thanks to the Mana Geode, he will be able to cast that. 
And Fernando now with not a mana issue in the world with that mana geode in play and all the blockers set in place. Deck looks a little clunky, just has a bunch of blockers, but uh, Olivier's deck isn't is, you know, the most powerful deck, uh, relying very heavily on the four power synergies with the Cron Tranglers. That's right. This isn't the worst though. An Iron Pulley can get that turret ogre big enough to attack. It would prompt some type of double block, most likely. Yep. But this could clear away at least one of the Ashiok Skulkers and uh, maybe down the line. No, no, no. He's going to put it on the Cron Trangler that didn't currently have a token uh, counter on it. Yeah, it looks like he just wants them to be roughly even, evenly sized to set up a turn where he draws an additional four power creature to have like an army of, of uh, you know, giant Cron Tranglers. But I think Olivier does need to kind of play it slow. It's kind of rough because he is playing against a more controlling deck. But if he, if he does play it slow, then he, if he draws, for example, ba back to back four power creatures, they will be five fours. That this is a huge good. turn for Fernando. He plays his other copy of Thunder Drake and then follows it up immediately with Cal's Dismissal. And now he's looking at his Flux Channeler and going, and you know what else I'd like to do? I'd like to proliferate as yes. well. So this Drake became a dragon quite quickly. Yeah. And of course, you will not get the additional plus one, plus one counter on the army token as um, you will get the token upon resolution of the Callus Dismissal. That's so right. the Flux Channeler will not be able to put that additional counter on the zombie token. But, you know, four or five flyer probably does a trick. I bet, I, I think Olivia now kind of wishes that uh, he put the plus one, plus one counter on the turret ogre as it has reach. But currently it is not big enough to trade with the Thunder Drake. And that is going to be game. Wow. The interesting part about the way that this one played out was that Fernando actually just did what Olivier was doing better. He mm -hmm. made more power and toughness on the battlefield right. and was able to establish such a dominating board presence that Olivier conceded. That is game number one going to Fernando Gonzalez. We'll be back with more limited War of the Spark here from London after these messages. War of the Spark, Mechanic Spotlight, a mass. Hey everybody, uh, look, I would love to take you around Ravnica, see the sites, get the locals to explain all the new mechanics for you. We just don't have the time. The end game has begun. As you know, Nicol Bolas has been busy and an important part of his plan is bringing the Dreadhorde, his army of Eternals from Amonkhet, right to Ravnica's doorstep. On War of the Spark cards, the invasion by the undead elite is represented by the new keyword, a mass. Let's take a look at Herald of the Dreadhorde. A mass is always followed by a number. On old Herald here, can I call you Herald? It's two. So when Herald dies, eh, farewell Herald, its triggered ability tells us to amass. Wonderful. To amass, first see if you control an army creature, and it looks like you don't. So create a 0-0 black zombie army creature token. Army is a new creature type. So 0-0 isn't like the most impressive stat line ever, but you're not done amassing yet. You get to put some plus one plus one counters on an army you control. The amass number tells you how many. End result, Harold dies and leaves behind a 2-2 zombie army. Not bad. The Dreadhorde invasion is upon us. And speaking of which, here's Dreadhorde invasion. So now your upkeep rolls around and it's time to amass one. But this time, you already control an army. Thanks, Harold. Never forget you, man. So you won't create another zombie army token. Instead, you'll just put one plus one plus one counter on the army you already control. Amass is designed so you control a single army, which you subsequently make larger. But there are ways for you to control multiple armies. Perhaps you copy an army, or one of your creatures has all creature types. If you amass and you happen to control multiple armies, you choose one of them to get all the counters. If your loyalties lie with the dragon, amass is a great way to run over anyone who would stop you. The Dreadhorde is on Ravnica, and war is on the horizon. Prepare.
And welcome back to coverage here in London. We're here for Mythic Championship 2. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm with Paul Chion. And Paul? I'm excited. We've got a bit of a spicy brew here over on our <laughs> oh, yes. side table. For those of you that were watching, you saw Yu Watanabe push the boundaries of uh, oh. of colors here. He's even playing Niv Mizzet, which costs what well, we call it Wooberg, all one of each color of mana in Magic. What are we looking at here from Yuya? Looks like we have a Soul Diviner. I believe Yuya has two Soul Diviners in his deck. I mean, Holy he, he's, he almost first picked that Niv Mizzet, by the way. I just want to say he agonized over what to first pick. And then when, when it tabled, he was like, yes. I'm gonna do it, and the whole time I was when I was watching, I was like, "Yes, do it, please! He's I want to see it." it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it looks like we have a soul diviner here with a two-two army token, and Yuya can use Th this the is, counters. This to is draw getting cards. sketchy, though, Paul. There's two shriek divers in the air, and that is lethal. And in fact, oh, yeah. game number one going to Andrew Watts. That is not how Yuya drew this up. Just doesn't have any outs left in his deck, so he's gonna scoop up his permanence, and we're gonna go to game number two. Yeah, but I will say that Yuya drafted just. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't even know. I mean, we haven't seen too many decks like this, and uh, you know, uh, w one thing to note in this format is just that the mana fixing is is pretty incredible. You know, uh, especially if you're base green, you have access to several commons like Centaur Nurturer and even New Horizons that give you access to uh, other color sources. But even at uncommon, you have green uncommons that are very powerful. Cards like Paradise Druid and Leyline Prowler that just also allow you to kind of stretch your mana to its limits. And mm -hmm. Yuya is basically doing that with those creatures on top of three copies of uh, Mana Geode as well. All right, well, you know, that's pushing the uh, the limits of the format. On the other side of the table, Jean Emmanuel Dupra, well, he kind of did so as well. That is a Charm Stray you see at the bottom of his creature row there. And he's actually running a few of those. We saw a similar build yesterday from Luis Scott Vargas of using this in conjunction with multiple copies of Ajani's Pride Mate to uh, you know, try to basically curve out into this huge army. And John Emanuel has tried the same thing. He has three Ajani's Pride Mate, four Charm Stray in that this a lot of cat Stray. life gain tribal thing that he's uh, put together. He also has a pouncing lynx just to uh, kind of complete the cat's theme. Yeah, we did really get to see kind of proliferate, really showcase its power yesterday. And just, you know, the the goal is to always get that first counter on your creatures. But with four copies of Charm Strays, if the games do go a little bit longer, it's pretty likely to get that counter into Charm Stray. Then once you proliferate, hey, 3-3 three, three, lifelink body is also uh, a, a pretty big game. Now, yeah. uh, Andrade here with a band it together here to actually deal with a 5-5. Five five. So as you can see, band together doing a lot of work and uh, one of the premier green commons in the set. And a big triple block here from Jean Emmanuel. Though it looks like our main table's ready to go, so let's get back to Olivier Ruel and um, Fernando Gonzalez as they gear up for game number two. That was uh, Fernando winning. And you know, I gotta say, Olivier, he looked pretty bothered at the end of that game. Took a second to step away from the table, maybe just trying to get his head right. Um, but the game looked like a fine start for him, and then he kind of got brick walled by a 3 5, and it never got better. Yeah, yeah. He really needed to find some kind of combat trick to attack through the Ashok Skulker. His opening hand was fine, but he, do he did need to just continue putting on the pressure and was unable, unable to do so. And uh, Fernando's you know, late game power just uh, ultimately ended up taking over. Vampire Opportunist is the uh, first play of the game here. It comes down for Fernando Gonzalez. And uh, let's see what we have on the three drop. It's a little weird not to see a two mana creature from Olivier. He actually has quite a curve. And it looks right. like it's going to be Vivian's Grizzly is the first play of the game here for Ruel. Though the good news for him is it does block quite cleanly against that Opportunist. Yes, definitely. It looks like he also had uh, a Raging Crunch, but Raging Crunch would not be attacking next turn. So... Yeah, also, you know, he has some benefits to keeping a Raging Crunch in his hand. If he's able to draw a Crunch Wrangler here, he may want to sequence it such that he can cast it a little bit later. Definitely. Crunch is good, though, man. Oh, yeah. Like, it can't attack on its own, but it can block just fine, and it's 
really overstat it. You know? Absolutely. I think a lot of people just kind of look at that and kind of compare it to some creatures like that that we've had in the past where, you know, it can't attack or block alone. But the drawback on this one is it just can't attack by itself. And a three mana four three blocker is just a very, very great body. Totally. And it, you know, if you do draft an aggressive the thing is the region crunch is actually just totally fine in both an aggressive deck or a defensive deck, mm -hmm. right? Three mana four three, great blocker, but if you are aggressive, you know, you're gonna have plenty of two drops and you're gonna be able to get in there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I the only downside from the control player's perspective is that it's in red. <laughs> like right. if that card was blue or black, I'd run it all day as just a great blocker and then later in the game, you know, start killing you. Yeah, absolutely. But but even in the blue red spells deck, it's just a fine option to have. You're not like super upset that you're playing Raging Crunch in your deck because it does just buy you time to kind of get all your spell synergies going. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. Fernando is actually going to take a fairly aggressive line here. He's going to use Callistus Missile just to put the Crunch back in hand, get that uh, army token going and crunch in for four damage. This does not seem like a tenable game plan for him long-term, given what we've seen from his build, but perhaps his hand, uh, you know, particularly lends itself to this sort of tempo-oriented approach. Yeah, if he probably, my guess is he, he had close to, I mean, he had just no other play available, right? If you had a three or four mana creature to play, you pr you're probably gonna do that, but uh, you know, Fernando does have some late game power, so maybe he just wants to prevent the, the assault from the red-green aggressive deck. Really interesting here as well. Olivier just says, go. Mm. Does not play anything. And given that he's got wow. the board stable here, that is that's going to allow him to activate Vivian's Grizzly. And he hit. I'm very curious as to why he chose to do that because you're so unlikely. You're only 50% chance to hit a creature. And you do want to put more pressure on the battlefield. Spending an entire turn to look at the top card to see if it's a creature or a planeswalker. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's not that's not something that you would look to do unless you think your opponent maybe has a, a counter spell of some sort and you just want to kind of play the long game with the Vivian's yeah. Grizzly. Yeah, the, the 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 play was definitely strange there from uh, Olivier Ruel. Though that said, he obviously could represent any number of cards in of his hand, making the attack from Fernando really difficult. And he got away with it, too. He right. actually hit the creature on top of it. <laughs> but the problem that uh, Olivier faces right now is not having more action in his hand. Look at that hand from him. He just needs to start deploying threats and doing it often. Right. And he's going to start things off with the turret ogre. Oh, and Fernando draws the card that will unlock his hand. What Mana Geode. Oh. Enters the battlefield, and Fernando in hand has both Ral, Storm Conduit, and of course <gasps> the Wombo Combo, Ral's Outburst. Really? He has both? He has oh, both. Oh, this is disgusting if this gets to happen. So we could see Ral right now. There's Ral hitting the battlefield, and by the way, that was two activations or two triggers for Flux Channeler, so that army token is growing at oh, quite a yeah. clip here. It is great, and keep in mind, yeah, Flux Channeler triggers not off just instants and sorceries, it's all non-creature spells. So the Mana Geode and the Ral both triggered the Flux Channeler, which allowed Fernando to proliferate and add counters to that army token. So this is going to put Ral up to six with a Scry 1. So not a super impacting play right now, but next turn the fireworks will start if Ral's still on the battlefield with at least two loyalty. Yeah. Especially here, given that the Turret Ogre dies to the, if both of these creatures die right. to the, uh, to the Rouse Outburst. So this is going to be really nasty if Olivier doesn't have some way to interact here. And, and look at this. It's, it's got six loyalty. It's just so hard to get off yeah, the battlefield. Huge. And you have to spend so many resources to, to get it off. And so even if you go out of your way to get this Rouse uh, down, that's six points of damage you could have been pointing to your opponent's face and in a red green deck, you only have so many resources available to you. So exactly. So look at this trade is going to happen here because Fernando's probably just going to say, "Sure, I'll trade off an army token for that thing." Yeah, he, he's probably going to say, "Look, if you got a, if you have a combat trade, oh, you have a combat trade." Oh, okay. I was wrong. So what he's really trying to do here <laughs> is leverage that flux channeler, right? And use the uh, he's going to be casting multiple spells over the course of the next few turns and just make it into a huge creature. But <coughs> it looks like. 
Ruel says he's going to have none of it, but this is still not going to end well for him. So that was Chandra's Pyrohelix to kill the Flux Channeler to solve that problem. But the downside here from Ruel's perspective is that all three of his creatures can die to Outburst. Yeah. And he can just pick which two he wants to kill. Fernando just has Ral's Outburst. He can copy it with Ral Storm Conduit and just cleanly kill two 4-3s this turn while getting up an additional card on both of those spells because, <laughs> yeah, and this is just huge. I mean, a And he's gonna also going to just mise two damage it. Ruel's face as well. Right, 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 I of mean, course. I mean, he's going to spend four mana here and two loyalty to do two damage to Ruel, kill two of his creatures, draw two cards, and it's even better than that because it's t look at the top two, draw one, look at the top two, draw one, rather than just two random cards off the top of the library. This is unbelievable. This is absolutely insane. I'm so jealous right now. Oh, <laughs> very, very jealous. He's, there he's it not going to be happy about this. I'm curious to see what Ruel does here because this is a disgusting display of value here from Fernando oh, Gonzalez. Wow. So he wants to take out the Turret Ogre and Vivian's Grizzly. And look at Ruel reading Ral. He's like, are you serious? <laughs> Keep in mind, many players don't have a lot of drafts under their belts. The set came out today, basically. <laughs> right. So that's two copies of Ral's Outburst, meaning that Fernando will be able to kill two creatures, and on each resolution of Rao's Outburst, you get to look at the top two cards of your library, pick <laughs> one, put it into your hand, and the other into your graveyard. So here we go, first, oh, first resolution. Well, we did say that Olivier Ruel was all about the crunch deck here, and that's all he's going to be left with after this flurry of value here from Gonzalez. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, that, that was kind of the, 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 the one issue with, with Olivier's deck where... He really needs to get off to a good start here with, you know, the Crunch Wrangler and, and, and a good curve because otherwise, you know, many of the other decks are going to have Planeswalkers and they're just going to be able to overpower you. So if you don't get off to that fast start, it's going to be really, really hard um, to, to put away games. So... Now we're kind of in the aftermath here. Right. <laughs> but that was likely the game-swinging play for Fernando, though there are ways for Olivier to come back. When we looked at his hand earlier, and then we can take a look right now as well, he had a ton of action, and he still does. Yes. Neheb in hand. He's just got a lot of power and toughness, and you know, the real downside here is for, from Olivier's perspective is that Fernando just drew two extra cards with card selection. It's just hard to imagine that he's going to run out of gas anytime soon. Yeah, and Olivier does have that Goblin Assault team, which means he can play it and attack with both the Raging Crunch and the Goblin Assault mm. team. So if Fernando, Fernando doesn't play a creature here, Olivier can get rid of wow. the Ral. Wow, look at this. Callous Dismissal has left Olivier with nothing. Oh, and I love it. Fernando just choosing not to attack that with the token insane. here. And mindful of something like a Goblin Assault team. And all Olivier Ruel can do is play Primordial Worm. It's 7-6. And it it's good here. That's, right? that's a fine play, but it doesn't do much on the board. And, you know, every turn that you let your opponent untap with a Planeswalker, you feel like the game slips away a little further and a little further. Yeah, but Gonzalez's hand is completely stacked here. He's got Death Sprout in hand for that Worm. He's also got the Lazatab Reaver and Herald of the Dreadhorde. So a lot of different options here. Wow. Uh, he could choose to hold on to the Death Sprout uh, to be able to kind of copy it with the Ral and just play out a few more creatures this turn. Maybe tick up the Ral. I would do that. Because, you know, you got a Ral for Ral. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. And even if Olivier spends all of his resources to try to get that Ral off the battlefield. Gonzalez does have uh, Innate the Fallen in his hand to return... To, to just reload. To return, yeah, to return... It has the ability to return both a creature and a Planeswalker. So it, there's Herald. And yeah, once again, things looking very good for Fernando. Gonzalez. These are uh, two of our undefeated players. Olivier with the only one left with an unblemished record. Gonzalez picked up a draw in game one, but has yet to actually pick up a loss in the tournament. And things looking very good for him to advance to 8 0 oh, 1. Absolutely.
Olivier perhaps asking a question there about Rao. But the, the shields are, are truly up here on the ground here for Gonzalez, thanks to the, uh, the Lazatep Reaver as well. He can use that to just chump block if he'd like. This army token is threatening to be bigger than any of the creatures in Olivier's deck in just a few turns if he can get a, a couple of more uh, activations on it. Definitely. And that's what's going to happen here. So the Reaver hits the bin. And Olivier does need to continue putting pressure on the battlefield, so he's yes. probably going to play a Neheb this turn. Yeah. And Especially because <laughs> he can play the Cronch as well. Right. But, but, but now Fernando's like, hold on, let me read this before I kill it, as he does have Death Sprout in hand. So he's yeah. going to use Death Sprout, copy it with Ral. What in the world? Get two additional lands out of his deck, and of course, static ability, two additional points of damage to Olivier. This is absurd. Jeez. This is just absurd. I'm and here it comes. <laughs> Splashed <laughs> Death Sprout. Sometimes, boom. sometimes you splash Death Sprout. Boom, boom. So that's two creatures dead, two damage, and two lands. So he gets the land out of the battlefield. Then he'll draw a card? Um, well, I no, don't think he, he's I don't, not yeah. going to get any cards. Sorry. Right, right. I don't think he, this was. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think he could have done it on upkeep because, of course, you have to minus the Ral to copy. Correct, yeah. Ral doesn't interact with instants in that way. Right. But, uh, but you know, I feel like this was this good wasn't enough. This was the worst, yeah, was you it? Know, yeah, reasonable. You take two, Olivier, <laughs> down to 12. So the question is, when, it, when can Fernando just start attacking here as well? Because he's played a very controlling route. He has yet to even turn the creature sideways. Yeah, it really depends on what else he has in hand. But I think probably one more turn because he is still, he has to kind of Played the entire game around the Goblin Assault team. You're wrong, Paul. Boom, boom. Both just, of them in the just, red just zone. <laughs> and, you know, to some degree, this makes sense, too, because Ral has already kind of provided a ton of value. And now you're putting pressure on Olivier. If Olivier does play a Goblin Assault team and attacks to get rid of that Ral, well, he's just going to die on the following turn. Mm -hmm. So... That's going to leave a 7-7 seven, seven army token after the Raging Crunch blocks the Herald. I don't even think Olivia has a way to deal with the 7-7. Seven, seven. Right. Like, that's the right. problem. In red-green, it just gets so difficult. He did not take a band together, which would have given him an out for it. So now Gonzalez just can force a chump block. Okay. Yeah, and that's going to do it right there. The game is over, and Fernando David Gonzalez has won two games to zero against Olivier Ruel and marked himself as the only undefeated player left in the field. He does, again, I, I mentioned have a draw on his record, but still really impressive stuff from him and a good way to start the day. A bumpy ride there for Olivier. You know, the worst part is that there were many times where his deck did what his deck was supposed to do, and he lost anyway. Yeah, I mean, the red-green deck is very straightforward. There's not a whole lot of tricks to it. You just need to draft a very good curve, be aggressive, and have, uh, and, and have some combat tricks to, to kind of double spell in a turn to put, put the pressure on it, and he just wasn't able to do that. And, um, I mean, just taking a look at Gonzalez's deck, it was not short in power, right? Those splashes were extremely powerful. Death Sprout, Ral, Ral's Outburst. And, I mean, we really truly got to see how powerful Ral can be, um, you know, in the, in the limited games from yesterday and today. Oh, 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 this wow, we, this is a little bit different than the last one we saw. Look at this. Just the ultimate seal. Is that an Enforcer Griffin from Yuya? I mean, the, Yuya is playing a base Saltai. I just, I'm just going to say base Saltai. Five forests, four islands, six swamps. But he's got, of course, three mana geodes. Mana is not an issue, so he's just playing the biggest and baddest spells that he can possibly fit into his deck. And, um, you know, I think those Shriek Divers were kind of problematic game one. So he probably just boarded in an additional flyer just to have more blockers. Yeah, that makes sense. In the meantime, though, he's, he's facing down from Andrew Watts, a very powerful Planeswalker, Sarkon the Masterless, on the other side of the battlefield. In fact, I saw that right when we came in, there was still a Dragon Token over there, but it just got killed. Uh, I think it got callously dismissed, perhaps. Ooh, okay. Yeah, which is probably one of the best answers for that type of card. And now Yuya Watanabe putting serious pressure on Sarkon, trying to get that Planeswalker off the battlefield at all cost. Yeah, it does look like everything is 
attacking Sarkin. Actually, uh -oh, wait. Does Yuya have something? Oh, he does. He has oh Nixilis's cruelty for the savage two-for-one blowout here. And this is going to leave a decimated board here for Andrew Watts as Yuya Watanabe gets the Planeswalker off the battlefield and clears the board from what looked pretty impressive down to the 2-2. Wow. Yeah, and he, he also has a card advantage engine online with a Soul Diviner too. He can start removing counters from that army token to draw cards. And we do know that there is no shortage of power in Yuya's deck. You know, well, that's uh, kind of coming into Ooh. this event. There are all these different strategies that you can have. But what, what was this? So he uh, had... <coughs> Aid the Fallen? Aid the Fallen to get back two, two cards. One of them was Sarkon. So that's pretty nice. With Aid the Fallen, you can choose one or both. Right. So he decided to go for both, of course, in this scenario. Yeah, yeah. but Yuya with a tremendous board presence here. He can start attacking with the Flyers and also attacking in with the army token here. And he's probably going to get in and then use the Soul Diviner to cash in the token for a card. But uh, looks like he has four lands in hand. Okay, so a little bit of a flood here for Yuya Watanabe. The Mayhem Devil came back down from Andrew, but this is the key play here. We have yet another Sarkon and making yet another dragon, and Yuya will have to deal with that at some point. Yeah. And if he's just got a bunch of lands in his hand, that is not going to get the job done. Absolutely. Let's take a look at what he's working with here. Oh, no. It's uh, a lot of forests. That a lot of forests. is a lot of green mana. He does have um, the ability to, you know, trade off the Enforcer Griffin and the Spider with the Dragon, if he so chooses, assuming Andrew has no combat tricks whatsoever. Well, and, and he actually just would get to trade off just the Griffin, right? Right, right. He can so double block and, 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 and just lose the Griffin. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> probably do that. Yeah, I mean, Sarkon also, though, can get you dead pretty quickly as well. The plus ability on Sarkon is until end of turn, each Planeswalker you control becomes a 4-4 red dragon creature and gains flying. So that counts Sarkon, but any other Planeswalkers you have as well. Also, I did see some questions earlier. Um, there's a kind of an interesting rule situation with this because when a Planeswalker becomes a creature, well, what, what happens when it takes damage? Because normally when you look at a card like Gideon, there's been many printings of Gideon, it'll say that the damage is prevented to Gideon. Right. You know, and Gideon's also often indestructible as well, which seems redundant. But the reasoning... We see big spark. removal spell That's here. That's a spark harvest. It is indeed. And uh, the Mayhem Devil is going to add to the issues here. And yes, that is Enforcer Griffin going down, plus a free damage from the Mayhem Devil. This should signal another spell from Andrew Watts, as he could have paid the full price on Spark Harvest to mm -hmm. just kill... The Enforcer Griffin, and, and now gave up some, some onboard material to do so. Uh, kind of interesting. Anyway, the, the, the way it works is the Planeswalker ends up becoming a creature that also has the loyalty abilities of it, but it's not a Planeswalker anymore. Right, any it is damage, a creature. Yeah, any damage dealt to it will not affect the loyalty at all. It'll affect the, the power and the toughness, right. but it still has its abilities as a Planeswalker. So it's kind of weird. It, right. It's a little bit of a different look, and my guess right now is that that's exactly what's being asked, is that uh, Yuya says, if I do damage to this, is it the three loyalty that I'm worried about, or is it the four toughness that I'm right. worried about? In this case, the answer is the four toughness. Definitely. So you cannot just block with the spider in trade. Mm-hmm. It is different. Oh. He might have another way to deal extra damage. No, it will not hmm. die. Oh, did it already take a damage or something? Well, maybe... No, it didn't. Yeah, I mean, he did ask a judge. Really? No, yeah, that, that is not... I, I looked this up the other day for this exact scenario... I'll read you what it says in the, in the notes from it. It says, once Sarkon's first loyalty ability, ability has resolved, each Planeswalker you control, including Sarkon, is no longer a Planeswalker for the rest of the turn. They do, don't lose any loyalty counters or abilities, and you can still activate their loyalty abilities if you haven't done so yet. So that all stays the same. They don't lose loyalty if they're dealt damage while they're not Planeswalkers. Okay, so, so it should be probably try to toughness. 
So maybe we stop it there and just get a double check because that yeah. is how I understood it. And again, having faced this scenario once, I mean, I've done not a ton of drafts in this format, but the one that I've done, that actually came up. Right, absolutely. And I don't think Andrew makes that attack if he... Right, he doesn't want to trade it off works. for that spider. Right, exactly. So maybe we could just get a clarification or... Yeah, but at this point now, Rouse Outburst has resolved. Oh, no. If the Sarkin's back on the battlefield, Rouse Outburst could have targeted the Sarkin. All right, I see the, the hand of stopping. It's going to be too late. I, I do want to get an explanation of this, though, to make sure that I understood the reading correctly because it is a little bit of a weird situation. And now we have the judges huddling over there. But yeah, I don't think that that Sarkon should have died, Paul. Yeah. That, I don't think that the three loyalty like was the, the in question there. Now, the thing I was trying to remember is, it, did Sarkon already have damage of some other sort, you know, on him after becoming a creature. If he took one incidental damage, then it would have been enough to be three plus the four. Right, but the but I don't but, think but that the, there's no way that for Yuya to have been able to deal right, one point exactly. of damage, right? I I know we know that the Mayhem Devil dealt one point of damage to something, yes. but certainly he's not going to target his own Sarkin. <laughs> it, with it, it was so. not Sarkin, no. So we'll we'll get this sorted out with the judges here as uh, they confer. I saw Ricardo Tessitore over there. He's kind of running the future match areas for us from the judge's perspective yep. here, and he'll be able to, to get a ruling in place. Uh, it is a weird scenario because, again, we kind of take it for granted, but if you look at any of the um, Gideons and such that will typically become a creature, they're often indestructible, and they also often have yep. the clause any damage dealt to them is prevented. Yeah. All right, let's take a look. This might take a minute to sort out. We will come back once they have it sorted. Um, so let's look over at Jean-Emmanuel Dupra versus um, Joao uh, Andrade. And this is 7-1 and one versus 7-1 and one, uh, for their record. So very high part of the uh, of the standings here. And Jean-Emmanuel has quite a deck here. We mentioned it earlier, but he's got this <laughs> cat-themed deck is what it kind of looks like on paper. But really, it's more of a proliferate deck at heart. Yeah, Cat Tribal. He has at least seven cats that we know of, right? Four, uh, three of Johnny's Primates and four Charm Strays. Uh, and he has a Pouncing, pouncing links. links. Yeah. Oh, wow. Eight cats. Okay. <laughs> Come on, dude. It's a oh. theme. <laughs> and look at that. That's a 5-5 five, five Charm Stray on the battlefield. Wow. That hello. Is huge. Oh, oh and, and this is a big turn here because oh, he just found Prison Realm to get that blocker out of the way. That is big because uh, because before Andrade did have access to the double block to trade off the Charm Stray, but now the Pro can just attack with both of these creatures. By the oh, way, oh, and this is a chump block. By the way, Paul, I, I have another monitor up that I know that uh, we can't see. I see rewinding happening. Okay. On the Yuya match, so I think we were right about that, and it looks like they may be uh, making a, a good faith attempt here to uh, get the game state back to that point and then go forward from there. It looked like, just at, at face value, that it was going to be difficult to do so, but now we've got a big play on our on our table here. Uh, Solar Blaze there yeah. from Andrade. Solar Blaze dealing with the cat. The pro will gain five life because the creatures deal damage to themselves, and the the cat, of course, has life link. The Huatli's Raptor still stays on the battlefield, however. But Andrade could have been sandbagging this. So now has the Wolf in play to trade with the Raptor. So the Pro with a very large lead in terms of life total. But ooh, Andrade chipping away here. Yeah, and, and, and you know, talking about the rewind, I, I think li very likely because Yuya Watanabe asked the judge whether or not he could block and trade. They probably have to go back to the spot where the spider still comes back onto the battlefield, and Yuya probably just takes the four damage from the Sarkin. So Yuya would get to make that decision on blocks again since he was given information that was incorrect. Yeah, so he okay. likely would choose not to block, untapped, and use Rao's Alpers to finish off the Sarkin. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, so Charm Stray, not the best top deck. One of the issues with the Charm Stray, of course, I mean, it allows you to get some very strong starts. It's uh, mostly a synergy card to go with the uh, Johnny's Primate, but you will, as you see here, you know, in the late game, you know, probably one of the worst cards you can draw. Yeah, you know, the, the I've seen this play out a few times now over the course of our draft portions here at the Mythic Championship, and that is that the 
uh, this deck tends to be one that you need to curve out in a fairly specific way. And if you do so, you are rewarded greatly by huge creatures, big tempo, way early. But if significantly disrupted, it has had a really hard time getting back on its feet. Absolutely. I mean, just frankly, it's just a very you know, low power, low impact card um, at, at any point past, I would say, you know, turns one and two of the game. Yeah, Luis Scott Vargas had a similar build to this yesterday, and he went one and two with it. Right, yeah. And this is a gigantic attack from Joe o here. It is a little bit scary, though, because you are, of course, at four life, and you want to play it. You want to be provide, have the right amount of aggression, but also just make sure that there's no possible way that your opponent can come back and win right. with a big attack. So maybe we just see yeah. an attack with two creatures here instead of three. I, yeah, I mean, knowing what I know, I would be pretty conservative if I was Joel. I mean, I, I'm the one who usually likes to try to close out the game when right. I know that I can and prevent any... Uh, prevent as many draw steps from my opponent as possible. But really, it feels like it's going to be so difficult for Jean-Emmanuel Duprat to come back from this point that I would just want to be, make sure I didn't get like, right. you know, removal spell, attack you, giant growth. Oh, what yeah. just happened, you yeah. know? I mean, I guess at the same time, you know, there is a, the possibility that Duprat maybe draws like a flyer. Yep. You know, and that, then... And that's then, a good example. And then so if you get in for less damage, you might not actually be presenting lethal damage over two turns. And, no, then, the, and, then, and then the prod draws a pump spell, and then you're like, oh, man, I should have attacked with three creatures. Totally. So there are multiple ways you can lose, of course. Yes. And I, w I would lean towards being aggressive as your baseline right. stance. Here, with the type of strategy that John Emmanuel Dupra has, it's just not built on creatures with individually great stats or high right. power and toughness. And look at that. Wow, a handshake. Turnaround. Wow. And that was game number three as well. So Joao Andrade picks up this one as well. Nice work. Kind of running the tables here near the top. Remember, those players were both 7-1. and one, So <laughs> that's some seriously great record here for a Mythic Championship. And it looks like we're still just maybe cleaning up the mess here over on Yuya Watanabe versus Andrew Watts. Yeah, and we talk about how uh, Yuya had a really sweet, powerful deck, but it looked like Andrew Watts also had a fair amount of power because when we looked in game one, he had a Dreadhorde invasion on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and he also has a Sarkin, which is you know considered to be one of the strongest rares in the set. All right, well, there still looks like just getting the last few details wrapped up here, so we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, hopefully we'll be back into action here on Yuya versus Andrew. We'll be back right after this. All right, welcome back. Thanks so much for your patience here while we get this sorted. Of course, this is really important, right? Uh, the, a game can be won or lost on an interaction like that, and it can be difficult to go backwards in time. So this is one of those things that we want to make sure that we give the judges the breathing room and the time to make sure to get the details right. So we'll let them do that. And once they're back in action, we'll get back down to you. But we do have other uh, updates that we saw a little bit of from the rest of the floor, uh, just to recap what we have in the future match area for this round. So first things first, we saw Olivier Ruel come in. We watched him draft his deck, but he ran into the buzzsaw. Fernando David Gonzalez, that deck looked great. It was yeah. blue, black, based, and then it reached its mana just a little bit for some really powerful spells. Green for Deathsprout, and there was two of them right. in there as well. And then the companion that we saw of uh, Ral and Ral's outburst in red. 
really won him the game, I mean, pretty easily in that second game. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kind of when we first w were handed the decklist and looked, we were like, this, this must be yeah. a disaster. This must be a mess. We saw the mana base. It was like 1772. Yeah. The, and the <laughs> mana, to be fair, not great. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It actually does work pretty well. All You know, as far as like number of colored mana sources goes, no problem. Uh, he, he did cover his bases. He may run into a few issues if he draws too many of those uh, off color basics. But otherwise, not too bad at all. Again, what we because what we do in the booth is we get one of these sheets that the players fill out. And my eyes go right to the upper left, which has the basic land count. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's like two forests, six island, one mountain, seven swamp. It's like, wait, that's 16? Like, what is going on here? Uh, <laughs> He is running two copies of Mana Geode, which really did kind of smooth things over for him. So yeah. that was that match going to uh, to Fernando. And then, of course, we had Jean-Emmanuel Dupra. He's playing against uh, Joel and Andrade. And, uh, well, we saw how that one ended just a few minutes ago. I'm going to say that while you do look at this Charm Stray and at face value, it doesn't look very strong. And then maybe you find some little like, oh, maybe I could try it and do it here. It has not been working. Uh, right. It might just be how it looks at face value where, sure, there are some specific times or specific decks where it might look like it performs well. It right. just hasn't been. Well, yeah, and also keep in mind that we are in a format with just better removal. You can't just try to often just do this one mana lifeline creature into a Johnny's Primate and then just win every game with a 5-5 five, five of Johnny's Primate. Your opponent will often have a way to deal with the Primate, and then guess what? You're stuck with a Charm Stray uh, in your hand. So it's one of those things where I think in very corner situations, you can maybe consider it. I think, you know, picking up the full three copies of it or three or four copies of a Johnny's Primate is a thing, or maybe even six Charm Strays, but yes. I think it needs to be something extreme to really warrant putting into your limited decks. All right, looks like we're back and ready to run here in our uh, side table that we popped in on. And now we have rewound fully here, Paul. So we've got the 4-4 Dragon on the battlefield. We've got Sarkon attacking into the red zone. And Yuya has decided not to block this time, unsurprisingly. <laughs> right, and now we have, of course, Angrath. Yes. Amassing for two. And... Uh, Andrew will now know that there's bad news coming. Right. But um, I wonder what they did with the Rouse Outburst. Well, I assume that you, you could just cast it, right? Well, he, right. But he got all this extra information. About the top two cards. About the slider. top cards. M maybe they're shuffling that, but that doesn't, of course, matter if your plan is to cast Rouse Outburst. And I'd be shocked if you didn't go ahead and fire off the Rouse Outburst here on the Sarkin. Yeah, especially given that Angrath is now on the battlefield, which right. also becomes a 4-4 flying <laughs> dragon oh, with yeah, Sarkin's plus. Definitely. It's just way too much damage too quickly. Right. So he really does need to stem the bleeding here and get rid of that rare Sarkon the Masterless as soon as possible. Yeah, and keep in mind, this is the second time Sarkon the Masterless entered the battlefield as Andrew Watts was able to recur it with Aid the Fallen. So mm -hmm. he's been able to create two dragons and also get in for some attacks with Sarkin as well. Yeah, you know, I think that Yuya kind of breathed a sigh of relief when he dealt with the first one and got Sarkin off the battlefield in that right. big turn when we first came in. But his troubles have <laughs> just began. And, I mean, not that it counted officially, but this will have to be the third time that he gets rid of Sarkin <laughs> right. before he tried to block. That did not work. Yeah, Yuya does have some, I'm going to say, heavy hitters in his deck. If he mm -hmm. at any point draws Niv-Mizzet, Boom, you have a 6-6 six, six creature on the battlefield that can generate some card advantage as Yuya does have plenty of gold cards in his deck. There's also Enter the God Eternals, which will be a clean way to answer that dragon token on the battlefield. Gain some life. And uh, the token would actually have flying because there's the Aven Skylord in play. Yeah, the Eternal Skylord. Or Eternal Skylord. Getting that thing up in the air as well. Yeah, th th this is Yuya's first pick here. And so it Go ahead. Yeah, it's a Merfolk Skydiver right. and uh, a great creature. You know, blue green for a one uh, for a one one enters a battlefield. It's basically a super pollen bright druid, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. It puts a plus one plus one kind of on any creature. And look at this spot. Look at how much mana Yuya has available. This is a fantastic mana sink, and Yuya can start channeling his mana <laughs> into counters on the Merfolk Skydiver, and also use the Soul Diviner if he so chooses to start drawing cards as well. By the way, what is going on with Andrew Watts? He has really gone all in on the Planeswalkers. This is Jaya Venerated Fire Mage now on the battlefield. Boy, I'll tell you what, Yuya is going to be very happy to have gotten Sarkon out of the way oh, because yeah. he was going to be taking infinite damage here. 
in the air. Now, though, he's in a beautiful position. He has the Soul Diviner plus the ability to effectively just pay five mana to put counters on his two creatures that have them and then draw a card anyway. I like Yuya's position here. I, I know that it looks kind of rough on board just given the fact that there's two Planeswalkers on the other side of the battlefield for Andrew Watts, but it really does feel like Yuya is still in a decent spot. Yeah, but this is a really tough situation for Yuya because Jaya does have that static effect. If another red source would deal damage, it deals one additional point of damage. So the dragon will be effectively getting in for five damage. The Mayhem Devil will be getting in for four damage. And... Uh, and also, Andrew hasn't actually used the Minus ability yet on the Jaya. He's waited to see how combat shakes out and then decide what he wants to do with Jaya's Minus 2 ability. Keep in mind, Jaya's Minus 2 ability will only deal 2 damage because it counts other red sources, not herself. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting scenario there that Andrew is actually incentivized to play Jaya pre-combat because of that bonus, right. but also that does give Yuya a lot of very valuable information about how to block here. Although, in, in truth, he may just find himself in a position where there isn't any great way to do this. Okay, he's going to double block with the Eternal Skylord and the Spider. So he's going to take nine damage here, go down to six. Wow. And remember, Jaya can deal two damage to any target. So wow. very close to actually just finishing off Yuya here, who's currently at six. Yeah. Angrath, Captain of Chaos, really putting a hurt on, on Yuya as well with that static ability, giving your creatures menace. Andrew probably going to be using Jaya on the spider here as he cannot actually remove the Skydiver because Yuya Watanabe has mana to proliferate and make it into a 3-3. Yuya perhaps feigning a combat trick here. He could activate the Skydiver use the Soul Diviner, and then maybe have some way to interact with the one mana that he's got left over. Excuse me, two mana that he has left over. Well, and yeah, what else does he have here? What's he doing? I just tapped the wrong creature. Oh, okay. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> yeah. All right. Draw a card off of the Soul Diviner. And nope, it is going to finish off that spinner. So down it goes. Again, Yuya Watanabe... Still in a decent position, but he is under serious pressure here from Andrew Watts. Yeah, I mean, Andrew has a good amount of pressure here. Yuya does need to find a big-time threat here. Enter the God Eternals, Niv-Mizzet. Those are the cards that he's looking for. He has been able to draw multiple cards, but Andrew just... I mean, Andrew has a very, very powerful board presence here with Jaya and, you know, the, the Dragon. And even the Grim Initiate is currently acting as a 2-1 first striker for one. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Yuya can find a way to get rid of one or multiple Planeswalkers here, right? Because, boy, that would be nice for him. It's yeah, just I, so difficult to attack Planeswalkers while you're also being attacked relevantly back. So one card that Yuya drafted, and I think this is a card you, had, you should actually not... Not lead table. I think you should take this reasonably high just in case. Is it? Is it? Well, no. <laughs> just in case the situations like this happen, yeah. is the Elder Spell. I think it's a fantastic cyborg card. If your opponent does have multiple powerful planeswalkers, the fact that you have this cheap, efficient way to deal with multiple planeswalkers is really, really powerful. Yeah, super, super powerful. Yu is now taking a look at the board and seeing what he can make of it. He found. A nice one. He found a Leyline Prowler, which can allow him to buffer his life total or act as a blocker to take down the Mayhem Devil on the ground. But, right, so Jaya down. He figures it's worth it to attack with his flyer here. Whoa, and he's drawing a card now? Wow, he really needs something, oh. and he doesn't find it. He finds a forest, so the best he can do is cast Leyline Prowler now. Which would be able to trade and... The Leyline Prowler could block the Mayhem well, Devil. He, he needs to double block, though. Wow, this has him going to one. And then with the Leyline Prowler back up to three. Right. But Andrew probably, you know, in the red black deck, has any number of cards here that he can draw. Yes. Many of which win the game on the spot, right? Mm -hmm. If he can kill the Leyline Prowler and just attack... Yuya taking some time here. This game. Has He's trying to feign that he has something in his hand. We know that he does not. Is there a clean out here for Andrew Watts? No, it's a 
swamp off the top of the library for him as well. So both players holding only lands. Yuya, though, oh, I, you know, I think Yuya was actually just asking, did I play a land this turn? Because that I was uh, a pretty important one. Absolutely. Allowing him to proliferate. He did have the mana available to do so, but he would have to tap his Paradise Druid. He may not want to do that. Andrew can choose to just maybe attack with the Dragon. I don't think attacking with the Grim and Shit does a ton here. Yuya has access to a lot of mana already. You might want to just end the game with the Dragon. Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. So it's going to get in for the four damage and knock Yuya down to two. Yuya needs to find an answer or, or, or you know, put pressure on the Angrath and get rid of that static. Creatures you control have menace means that exactly. Yuya cannot just block the dragon with Merfolk Skydiver. He needs to find either another flyer or get that Angrath off the battlefield. He's going to have access to a lot of cards here. His, he's drawn a card for the turn. And he can draw an extra one with the Soul Diviner. That's two cards right now. But he has to find an answer. Yes, he, he has no other way. Of course, there's a forest. We knew about that. That is a lot of... Oh! oh look at that! Enter, enter the like, God oh, Eternals! Oh, my goodness! For Yuya Watanabe. That is exactly huge! Exactly what he wanted to see. Now he gets a 4-4. Wow, four. just what the doctor Whew. ordered. Back up to 6 life. Thank you very much, top of the library. And Yuya Watanabe has taken control of this game. He is going to end up gaining 6 life. We're attacking now. Oh, boy. What a turn of events for Yuya Watanabe. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what he was looking for. Incredible. Incredible swing there for Yuya. He had been flooding out, drawing too many lands, and that is going to end the game. Yuya Watanabe, one game apiece now with Andrew Watts. Yuya says, finally, Enter the God Eternal <laughs> showed up. I kind of wanted to see Niv Mizzet into enter, revealing Enter the God Eternals. That's what I wanted to see. That's what you wanted, Paul? Yeah, that's what I wanted. <laughs> All right, players are going to start consulting their boards for this Game 3 Decider. And we're going to take a short commercial break. We'll be back right after this.
Welcome back to the feature match area here in London. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm with Paul Chion. We're here for Mythic Championship 2. We've got a Magic Fest going on. We've got War of the Spark pre-releases. A lot happening here on the event site. But for now, our focus is on game number three here between Yuya Watanabe and Andrew Watts. These players are both sitting with a 7-1 and one record, looking to improve that here in our first round of draft on day number two. And we had quite a game. Wow, it looks like they really got started here as well. So what are we looking at here, Paul? It looks like Yuya played a Toll of the Invasion, which is why you see Andrew Watts' hand face up. I this see. is often something you see at kitchen tabletops. It's like, hey, you know, I revealed my hand, so I'm just going to reveal it like this so it's easier for you because you don't have to write it down anyways. And this just makes the game go faster because, of course, we've had some long grindy games already. But uh, Yuya drawing one of the MVPs of his deck, Mana Geode kind of unlocking the full potential of what his deck can do. Yeah, the foundation <laughs> yeah. for uh, for the skyscraper he's built on top of uh, the mana that he's put together here. Andrew Watts with a really interesting card in hand, though. I believe that's a Command the Dread Horde, mm. that black sorcery there. So, you know, in a matchup where your opponent's not really pressuring your life total a bunch and you're the aggressor and you have a lot of removal, this card can, can potentially do some good work. You, you're taking advantage of the information that he's gained, that heart fire sitting in hand for Andrew Watts. Just out of range is Ugin's Conjurant here. And Shriek Diver, not really what the doctor ordered here for Andrew. I suppose he can start pressuring it, but he's woefully behind on board at this point thanks to that 5-5. Five five. And if you're not attacking, I feel like you're kind of setting yourself up to, to he, block. He'd rather leave Chandra's Power Helix... I see. Or Heartfire available, I suppose. That's at a pretty steep cost. Right. And here he does have a window to use the Power Helix to kill the army token if he'd like. Oh, it looks like he wants to maybe use a Heartfire, and then if he draws a land, he can play Command the Dread Horde to get uh, both the Shriek Diver. No, he no? just went for the Power Helix. Okay, he did find a land. He does have two swamps as well. Keep in mind, Commander Dread Dreadhorde is a powerful card, but it does come at the cost of your life points. Every per every creature or planeswalker you recur, you will lose life equal to its converted mana cost. Did you see what you you just drew? Didn't take him this long this time. <laughs> Enter the God Eternals off the top of the library for him. Now he doesn't need to cast it right now, but you have to figure that'll just about lock it up. Right. He's going to play Soul Diviner this turn. He's got this combo going as well. He can just start slowly cashing in the Ugin's Conjurant for cards after card after card. Absolutely. And he also has a Paradise Druid. So just yeah, very, very smooth draw here for Yuya. Let's actually take a look at his hand and see what he's working with. <gasps> he's got both. He's got. How close is he to casting that thing? He's got four colors right now if he casts the uh, Paradise Druid. Oh, so, so he'll just need... You know, either mountain, forest, or swamp. That's right. Or plains, rather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Yuya taking a quick look at the graveyard for Andrew Watts, and that is because of Command the Dreadhorde in hand for him. Yeah. We do have time in the round here, by the way, so we're in extra turns now, though. Yuya looks like he's in a fine position to be able to close out this game, assuming that uh, Andrew doesn't do anything completely absurd. He's so only got a mountain in hand after playing that. Well, this is a lot of damage. It, now, now I don't of course think he can afford all of this, right? right? Because Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Th it would be, he put him at one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he could just survive, though. Right? I mean, they're all permanents. I mean, uh, Yuya's deck isn't really going to be playing a whole lot of burn spells. It looks like he's choosing not to return the Shriek Diver, but he's still going to go ahead and take eleven damage here and go to four. I like it. All gutsy, right, gutsy stuff here from Andrew. Oh yeah, yeah, and. Uh, with Angrath, he wanted to use the Angrath, so he has a 4-4 army token. But uh -huh. remember, Yuya does have Enter the God Eternals here. That's right. Now, Enter the God Eternals cannot hit players, so he won't be able to just simply go upstairs with that. But he, he can hit the 4-4. But yes. any type of... if Yuya has three different lands he can draw here to just run out Niv-Mizzet Reborn. That's right. At this point, I don't think Andrew Watts can reasonably win within turn, so he's going to be playing for the draw here. Yuya, with all the tools, just needs the time. 
And he doesn't have that much of it, Paul. Right. We are right. in turn number two here. That was a very big swing for Andrew Watts. Getting a full board state from nothing here, but it did cost him dearly. He's down to four life. Yuya currently, I believe, deciding how he wants to fire off the Enter the God Eternals. Because yeah. that gets him the most, the, the quickest way to both get a creature off the battlefield and give him one to set up the turns. If this is turn two for Yuya. That means that he's going to have turn four. And that is it. And that's it. So he might be looking to use Soul Diviner to find maybe a, a, a mana source to play Niv Mizzet. Yeah, Niv Mizzet is a 6 6 with flying, and it right. has the Inner to Battlefield ability that's pretty splashy. But here, <laughs> I, I think he just wants a lethal threat. Then he could use Enter the God Eternals to kill the spider and get the job done. Yeah, as a Soul Diviner, not really doing a whole lot on offense here. This is actually really tough because right. now that I say that, he needs to kill the spider and or <laughs> either the token or. The Eternal Skylord, there are two flying blockers, and that's all assuming that he could even get the Niv-Mizzet down in the first place. Oh, I see. What, uh, this is a tough choice. So Yuya Watanabe actually has, taking a look here, he has a Mana Geo too. So Mana Geo, ah. if he draws a land off the top, he will be able to play Niv-Mizzet. So that's why he's really you know, putting that Soul Diviner aside and thinking, okay, do I need to sacrifice this? to Because if I draw any land, even an island or a swamp, I can play Mana Geode and still have the mana to play Niv-Mizzet, setting up a potential kill on, tur uh, on turn four of turns. Oh, this is about as close as they get. Because Yuya's in no danger of actually losing this game. No, that's right. not the problem. But he really needs to find a way to get the win down. Maybe he's just going to go for oh. Enter the God Eternals here. So another thing Yuya can do is just run out the mana geode first. Because mana geode, when, you, when it enters the battle, it scries, right? So you play the mana geode, scry. If it's not a land on top, you can bottom and then draw with the Soul Diviner to find the Niv-Mizzet. He's got a lot on his plate here to try to get this game won. Yep, and that's what Yuya's doing here, setting up for Niv-Mizzet for potentially a lethal oh attack next turn. Goodness. Oh, look at that slow. What, what is it? Is it a land for Yuya? I he, think it's a land. He's put it back on top. I mean, honestly, I just want to see Niv Mizzet resolve. You know, I, I wouldn't hate it either. <laughs> you but wouldn't hate it. How is he actually going to win the game, though? Well, he kept on top, so I mean, it, it, it has to be a land. And then he's hoping to get rid of both the spider and either the token or the Skylord. Right, but the thing is, this is a lethal attack, so Andrew does have to block with one of these creatures. Right. He's actually going to block with both. So you... And then, so Yuya can remove a counter and still have the Conjurant kill something. So this is what's going to happen. Yuya is now going to kill the spider, right? So Andrew Watts' next turn can make a 6-6 six, six creature with flying, but then what Yuya can do on the following turn is play Enter the God Eternals to kill the Skylord. Yes. And then attack for lethal with Niv-Mizzet. So that's what Yuya's setting up here. This is a very precarious act from Yuya Watanabe, but it does look like it has a chance. You got to kill the 1-3, not the 4-4 four, four here, because you want to win in the air. Okay, he drew the land. It was a forest off the top of the library, so thanks to the druid. Here it is. niv Mizzet Reborn on the battlefield. Show me what you're working with. Ten cards. Let's go. For each color pair, he's going to get cards. Now, the, the interesting part about this is that it's not actually super relevant <laughs> what he hits. He right. really just needs the flyer. Because he has the Enter to God Eternals in hand, but he just wants the 6-6 six, six flyer. So now Andrew needs to find another flyer or a removal, removal spell for Niv-Mizzet to actually survive. He also could gain three life, and that would put him out of range. Let's see what Andrew Watts has. Can he find his way out of this? Oh, boy, this is a, uh, a complicated situation for Yuya to face, but thanks to resolving Niv-Mizzet Reborn into Enter the God Eternals, he has somehow found a way. <laughs> <laughs> somehow casting your two best rares uh, gets it done. But, yeah. I mean, that was a really difficult sequencing turn, and Yuya did not want to mess that up. Keep in mind, this is the only turn Yuya has yes. to try to win this game. This is it. Turn four of yep. five, and here it is, the line that you exactly described, oh. and it wins. <laughs> Yuya Watanabe chaining oh. rare into rare and getting the job done. What a great match and super, super close down the stretch as well. Andrew Watts 
really gave him all he could handle there. Yeah, absolutely. And and just put it seeing through the line, figuring out what your win condition needs to be. But keep, because keep in mind, at the time, Andrew had multiple ways yeah. to block flyers. Yes. And Yuya had to not only piece together the fact that he needs to attack to force the chump block, then he had to put himself in the best situation by sequencing the mana geo first to give himself two shots at drawing the land into the Niv Mizzet. So everything had to be done exactly in that order yes. for Yuya to win. Wow. And of course, Yuya Watanabe figured it out because that's his job. I mean, that's MPL, what he does. That's what he does. He wakes up and he thinks about these scenarios, <laughs> and it actually came through for him there. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap up round number one, take a short commercial break. When we come back, though, we'll be gearing up for round number two of draft. Don't go anywhere.